The way I would describe GVS to someone who's never heard about it is to describe it as a neurological condition. It's a quite a serious neurological condition that can affect your nerves, leading to weakness predominantly, but also sensory changes like numbness or tingling. It can affect the arms and legs, but can sometimes also affect your ability to breathe or um, your ability to chew, swallow, and speak. And the unique thing about GBS, because there's a number of other nerve conditions like this one, is that it usually occurs quite rapidly. And a lot of times it's triggered by something, usually an infection. So about 60% of the time after an infection, like an upper respiratory tract infection or a gastrointestinal infection, someone can have a reaction to it and um, develop this condition. The reason behind it is perhaps uh, something called molecular mimicry, which means that um, the microbes, the virus or the bacteria that one is exposed to looks similar to some components of the nerve. So the body thinks it's protecting itself, but it actually will cause some damage to the nerves and lead to this condition. So some of the early symptoms that practitioners should be aware. Uh, I think the key is the speed at which the symptoms develop because as I mentioned many neurological conditions overlap. They cause weakness and numbness uh, and a lot of people feel that for many different reasons but when something is relentlessly aggressive and develops rapidly over a period of a number of days or weeks up to about uh, six to eight weeks and someone uh, develops these symptoms of weakness, numbness and sometimes in an ascending pattern, meaning it starts in the feet and rapidly moves up the arms or legs. Sometimes not. Sometimes it can affect the arms and legs in a different pattern, but when the key is when it happens very aggressively and relentlessly, I think GBS should be on the top of the list. So some of the um, testing methods that we use to diagnose GBS, uh, a lot of it is clinical, meaning just by speaking to the patient, examining them, uh, and identifying the pattern of weakness. We use the reflexes often to see they are reduced in GBS. That's one of the key features, uh, as well as the neurological examination. But we often will use other tests. One of the ones we use is nerve conduction studies, so nerve tests. The challenge there is that it's not easy to access those tests always. Uh, we also uh, will use spinal fluid analysis. So this is a spinal tap. We get a bit of the fluid and uh, analyze it. And a lot of times we will see increased protein there. So this is the proteins that are presumably damaging the nerves. And we will see an elevation there. Now these tests can be difficult to obtain. So a lot of times they are done in hospital when someone is being suspected of GBS. So there is some uh, treatments that can um, either halt or reduce the aggressiveness of the GVS, and the earlier they're instituted, the better. So if someone is, uh, gets to hospital and, and is diagnosed and is treated with something like IVIG, intravenous immunoglobulin, or plasmapheresis, which is an exchange of the blood, as early as within two weeks, that gives the patient a best chance of recovery. And if it can happen even sooner than that, then the better ch the chance of recovery. So that's why the sooner the better, for sure. And uh, if it can be done even sooner than that, within the first few days, uh, again, the better chance of recovery. So again, usually that uh, is done in hospitals. So when someone is, can identify that and be referred to a hospital to get the tests and early treatment, that gives the patient the best chance of recovery. Recovery uh, from GBS is different for everyone. Uh, a lot of it depends on the aggressiveness of the GBS as it occurs. A lot of it will also um, depend on how quickly uh, the patient is identified and maybe receives one of those treatments like IVIG or plasmapheresis. But after that acute period, um, the usual or routine uh, recovery phase is um, a fairly um, early phase of recovery that can occur uh, more quickly and there can be an early phase followed by a longer uh, plateaued but increased chance of recovery that can occur over a longer period of time. So generally the initial recovery, we always hope for that 
early um, boost of recovery that can occur with the treatments uh, over the first few days or weeks. But the general recovery that follows, that's a little more slow, can occur usually over months and sometimes even uh, into the second year after GBS. After this period of time, um, recovery is thought to be perhaps very slow or a plateau may have reached. Now having said that, I have heard of patients still getting gains after many years after GBS, um, but generally we're talking about the first year or two after the GBS where most of the recovery will have occurred. So the best uh, course of recovery and resources to access early on and uh, after GBS, I think uh, should be multifactorial and multi-resource type of approach. So you mentioned a uh, number of allied health teams, uh, including physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech and language therapy, respiratory therapy, and social work. I think these are all valid as part of the team, um, including mental health. Um, this is a nerve disease, so this should not affect the brain or cognitive or mental status, but as we know, with such a severe illness, uh, there can be mental health component to it. So, um, but I think the, one of the most important things to tackle because it affects the nerves and muscles, strength, balance, would be physiotherapy. So both to try to regain strength, maintain flexibility, but also to regain balance and regain some of the functions. And that's where occupational health, uh, uh, therapy also becomes critical, to learn how to do just day-to-day -day activities and day-to-day -day functioning that, that we may have been lost with GBS. And then the need for respiratory or speech therapy, for example, depends on if those areas were affected. So if someone's breathing or swallowing was affected, that th those are critical as well to try to reincorporate and, and rehab from that. All the while maintaining the you know someone's mood, stabilizing that, and providing support. So the way that GBS can affect people in the long term, um, because. Uh, weakness and sensation and balance is affected. These are the main things that can remain and one would hope for additional improvement and stabilization and recovery from these but uh, these are the types of things that one can feel after GBS. Uh, so residual weakness, um, residual balance difficulties, uh, performing daily activities. Um, some of the things that are not um, talked about as much uh, from these other obvious symptoms are pain. So a lot of patients with GBS can have pain. Um, imagine a you know brick uh, carrying a set of bricks uh, around or uh, wearing gloves while you are trying to maneuver and do things. Um, so you hope that these things are lifted from you. But but if you push through, it can be painful. Joints and ligaments can then be affected. Um, so there can be muscle soreness. Some other symptoms are fatigue. Fatigue is huge in GBS, even though it's primarily the nerves and muscles uh, because it takes so much effort to do di regular activities. Fatigue is a big f factor. And then one final one is muscle cramps. Muscle cramps can often uh, occur in, many setting, in the setting of many nerved diseases, and GBS is one of them as well. Something to be aware of and maybe to ask about. I think the advice I would give to a f uh, patient or family members that have been recently been diagnosed with GBS, first and foremost is that uh, you're not alone. This is a rare disease, so perhaps seek uh, others around you. Then that's where uh, CIDP GBS Foundation is key to kind of provide support and information, and also seek resources about uh, what is expected, um, uh, about some of the therapies and some of the rehabilitation that can occur. And also to main, maintain hope. There is always hope for ongoing recovery, especially the first year or two after the, uh, the illness. Uh, it might seem like dire straits at the beginning that uh, something so traumatic and difficult has happened, but with rehabilitation there can be recovery that will happen. GBS is not expected to happen again or recur or be a chronic disease, but it is a what we call a monophasic disease. It hits you hard early, but after that phase there can be improvement in recovery. So always maintain hope. Uh, I got a call um, in the middle of the night while I was on call 
and heard the story about someone with rapid progression of weakness and GBS was on the very top of our minds uh, and rushed to the hospital to try to s confirm that that was the case and as I said intervene as soon as possible. This person had gotten to the hospital very quickly which was encouraging so we were very hopeful that treating uh, this would help halt the progression and this is something that was evolving hour to hour so you know in the morning he had had some arm weakness by the afternoon his legs were very weak and so we worked very hard with the ICU team, the intensive care unit, the medical team to really try to get him the best treatment with IVIG as soon as possible. So it's not always easy to mobilize this. It can be a, a complex treatment to give but all the treat, uh, treatment teams were involved very quickly and we got it in into him within hours and really saw the effects of slowing the process down quite quickly so over the next day or two uh, it was almost like putting the brakes on this relentless process and uh, I just saw him uh, today and, uh, and after he left hospital he's now in the rehabilitation phase uh, so it's very encouraging when you can intervene quickly and uh, halt that progression and see someone recover.